everybody. How you guys doing? All right. So, quick announcement. Well, a couple. There's a some, couple, couple things I want to mention. One, I want to have a baptism soon. Um, I don't know exactly when, but soon, sooner than later. Um, wow, as long as it's not too crazy hot and as long as the river's full. But should we have our baptism? I'm thinking maybe July, August. Maybe June, I don't know. You guys give me some ideas. If anybody wants to get baptized, come talk to me. If not, then I guess there's no need for a baptism. But if we do have it, it'll be down at the Rio Grande River. We did that last year, and it was dope. We were only able to do it in the beginning of the summer last year, though, because towards the end, the river became not so much a river as it, much as it is a, like a mud puddle. You know, but as long as it's rivering, we'll we'll have a baptism. So if there's anybody who wants to be at baptism, anyone online who's interested, message me and reach out. Um, if you're on YouTube, don't respond on YouTube because I don't respond to those till like months later. Like go online, expoundbiblechurch.com. My number is on there. Send me a text. Um, if there's anybody here, approach me after service and just hey, I want to get baptized. Talk to Kurt or Teresa. They'll tell me. And I'll, we'd love to baptize you. Make sure you know what it means. Uh, second thing is. I have a friend, Gary Mabu. He has a ministry called Friends of the Fatherless. There are two things that the Bible tells us is pure and unadulterated religion to God. Serving the orphans and serving the widows. That's it. Everything else, up for debate. But that's undefiled religion. That's just pure religion. That's good before the eyes of God. Gary Mabu goes around the world and he serves orphanages. He has a thrift store called Friends of the Fatherless. It's up on like Wyoming and Indian School. I thought figured it'd be on here. Well, if anybody is interested in checking out Friends of the Fatherless or getting involved in missions work with fatherless children, come see me after service. I'll get you in touch with Gary Mabu. Awesome dude, solid dude. Known him for a while. He's a real cool dude. Hopefully he'll come by at some point. Um, you guys will get to meet him. But if there's anybody interested in that type of missions work, talk to me after service. I'll get you in touch with Gary. It's a great ministry. Um, say it again? Even just volunteering at the thrift store. Again, he has a thrift store that I believe all profit that, that comes from that store goes to these orphanages. So again, if you want to shop there, Friends of the Fatherless, Wyoming and Comanche. Indian school, Wyoming and Indian school. If, even if you like to thrift, go there. You know, every, everything that comes in that's a profit goes to orphanages. And everything in the store is 50% off. The store is 50% off. Sales pitch. Nah. But, you know, it really is a cool ministry. You know, he really has dedicated his life to, to, you know, serving these kids. And he really does go around the world to some pretty hostile places to serve orphans. And, you know, the orphan issue is a really big issue. But that being said, if you'll turn your Bibles to John chapter 17, um, we are going to slow down quite a bit as we get into the text. We're only going to cover the first five verses. And I think you'll see why as we get through these five verses, because it's packed full, it's full of a lot of meat. There's a lot of good stuff that we're going to extract from these five verses. And so I hope that you know you brought your thinking caps on. Because we're going to dig into the text. Today is going to be a very theological, in-depth teaching. And if you don't know what theology is, it's the study of God. It's when you start pulling those ideas from the Bible that help us understand who God is as a whole. That's, that's the idea behind theology. It's, it's, it's gaining the understanding of who God is to the best of our degree. Because we'll never fully be able to understand Him because He's God and we're not and it's a good thing that we don't fully understand him or he wouldn't be God. But let's pray before we get into the text. Father, we thank you for being our God. We thank you for your goodness and for your mercy and grace. We thank you for your favor, Lord, that you give us daily. You give us breath to breathe, life to live. And we pray that with what you've given us, Lord, that we would give back to you everything, that we would live it to you to the fullest extent. Help us not to be full of bitterness, Lord, full of greed, anger, frustration. Help us, Lord, not to be full of jealousies or envies, drunkenness, carousing, anything that's of the flesh. We ask that you would remove those things, Lord. Help us to put those to death by crucifying our flesh and help us to live to you, Lord, holy and pure. Help us to do what is right before you. As we get into your word, Father, may your word teach us to burn those things away. May your word teach us to live in such a way, Lord, that you would be glorified. May our 
obedience to you be pleasing and glorifying to your holy name, Father. We ask as we get into your word this morning that you, Lord, would be the teacher. Help us to hear your voice. I pray, Father, that you'd get me out of your way and that you would be the teacher this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I have two stepkids, and, you know, they're what somewhat made me a dad, you know. They, they made me a dad. Ezekiel made me a father. A little bit different. But they made me a dad. I married my wife. I think I was 26. You know, I don't remember. all The numbers are a little blurry to me. You know, I want to say it was 2016 we got married. Whenever it was, that's when I became a dad, you know. So I, I got what you call an instant family. It's like instant oatmeal. You just pour hot water and there it is. You know, it doesn't take a whole lot. It's just there. And so I, I didn't learn some of the key things that you learn like when you have a baby from the womb because there are some key points that you want as a father that you don't get when you get an instant family. So if you're in an instant family, be gracious to the one who's not the biological person because there are some really tough issues that come with that. But one of the things that I used to crack up on when my kids were younger is they would say things in a way that they would ask for things without asking, right? And one of the things that my kids would do is a roundabout way. They'd say something like, mm, you know, ice cream sounds really good. I'd be like, you know, ice cream does sound good. Mm, I just wish I had some ice cream. You know, me too. So I'd go pull out some ice cream, and I'd just make myself a bowl. <laughs> kind of messed up, right? But I'd make myself a bowl, and I'd start eating it. I'd be like, mm, this is really good. Mm, that looks so good. It is good. Man, too bad you don't have something. This is really good. You know, you, you could tell. All I wanted them to do was ask me for a bowl of ice cream. That's it. I wanted them to know that they can come and ask in my heart. And I still stand on this. The ability to ask me something gauges how deep our relationship really is. If you can't ask me, then you don't know me. That We're not as tight as we think we are. If you can't come to me and speak to me in such a personal manner. And so I saw their inability to ask me as a disconnect of our relationship. So I would do that. And then finally, if you want some ice cream, ask. Can, can I have some? Yeah, you can have some. That's all I wanted to ask. Because as a parent, you understand that's one of those key things that, you know, that is a connection between the biological parents is the ability to ask is just there. My son Ezekiel asks for everything. You know, daddy, can I have? Daddy, can I have? Daddy, can I have? You know, I, I give up most of the time and when I shouldn't. Like yesterday, I gave him a bowl of cereal at like four in the afternoon because he asked 17 times. It reminded me of that, that parable that Jesus gives of, you know, the annoying lady and the judge. She just kept asking and asking and out of annoyance, the judge, you know, protected her. That's how I felt giving him the bowl of cereal. Like, kick this bowl of cereal and get away from me, you kid, you. You know, I, but the ability to ask, that shows me, that gauges in my heart how disconnected or connected my relationship is with especially a kid. And I believe God feels the same way. I believe one of the ways that we know how connected or disconnected we are from God is our ability to come before Him and ask. Just ask. The original nature of humanity avoids petitioning God unless we absolutely have to. As a matter of fact, within Christian circles, you often hear this. I've done everything I can. All I can do now is pray. All I can do now is, is petition the living God, the one who is in all control, the one who has the ability to do all. All I can do now is that. That should have been the first thing the Christian does. And when we use a statement like that, again, it doesn't tell me you don't have a horrible relationship. It tells me that you have either a misunderstanding or there is a disconnect there. Because as Christians, that should be the first thing we do, is go to the Lord. Go to the Lord. Again, I believe there's nothing more that our Father in Heaven wants than for us to be able to come to Him, boom, in the moment that something happens, we're there, we're with Him. I think of Joel. For some of you know Joel. He usually comes on Wednesdays. He sits in the back. If you know him, you do. If you don't, that's okay. He got in a wreck a couple weeks back. Somebody ran him off. I don't know. It was some horrible accident. By God's grace, like he's alive. 
And he had called me right after the accident, excited. And I'm like, I'm trying to, you know, compute here. Like, I would be angry, you know. And I mean, he was uh, frustrated, but he was excited. He said, you know, Walter, the moment that happened, the first thing that came to my mind is I started praying to God. He says, I would have never done that before. Because he's cultivating a relationship with, with the Lord. The moment something happened, the first thing, the first instincts that came to his mind was the Lord. And, you know, he believes God spared him. And, I mean, if you, if you talk to him on Wednesday, ask him about the wreck, and he's lucky he's alive. But he says, God totally spared me. And it was crazy. He says, I don't even, it was all so fast. Just, it was all a matter of three seconds. He said, but in those three seconds, I was praying. The ability to petition God in the moment something happens. Again, our original nature keeps us from wanting to petition God because we use sentiments like, oh, God's too busy. Oh, God's got bigger things to deal with. But does he? Your problems are pretty jacked up. <laughs> they are, though. You know, your problems mean the world to the Lord. And when we understand who he is, we understand that he wants all of the problems, not just the ones we think are deserving to go before him. He wants them all. All of them. And he's able and capable of not entertaining, but addressing all of the problems. And still addressing everyone else's also, because that's part of his nature. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at once. He can give you his full, undivided attention and still give me his, as well as all of you at the same time, his full undivided attention. He wants to be a part of all of you, every bit of you, the big and the little alike. I believe a healthy and strong prayer life is the sign of a healthy and strong relationship with the Lord. When we look at the life of Christ, his life is characterized by prayer. When we see the start of his ministry, it starts in prayer. As he goes to get baptized, it begins in prayer. As he travels off to do his missionary work for the next three years, we're told throughout the Gospels that he would often disappear in the middle of the night and go pray. The disciples would be baffled that, where is he at? He was off in the mountains somewhere praying, just alone with his father. He prayed. When he chose the twelve, he prayed. Before he fed the 5,000, the Bible says he looked up and he prayed. He gave thanks to the Lord. After the feeding of the 5,000, he prayed. Before the feeding of the 4,000, a little later, he prayed. At Peter's confession, you know what he did? No, he not he prayed. <laughs> I was going to say something else, but I say he walked off and took a leak. No, he prayed. He prayed. I'm sure they did the... I can, you can pray. You know, you, here, here's one for you guys. You know, when I was a new Christian, my prayer time and my quiet time with the Lord was on the toilet. It's the only place I would actually read because I wouldn't read anywhere else. You know, I was smoking lots of weed and, you know, doing my whole gangbang drug deal kind of deal. You know, just living life. Just came to Jesus. Didn't know anything and I didn't like reading. But I, I remember thinking, you know, when I would use the rest, you might get out my phone and read. So I was like, well, what if instead of reading my phone, I'd just like read a verse? And so I would. I'd read a whole verse and be like, oh, all right, where's my phone? And that was like the first couple months as a Christian. I'd just like read a verse or two. And then I started to feel a little bit bad, right? So I started reading like a paragraph. And before long, I would just, you know, I would read a chapter. And it got to the point where I became so enamored with the Word of God that when I was done using the restroom, I'd go sit on my bed and read some more. Because I just wanted to know more about the Lord. But I remember thinking, if I honor God, what up? If I honor God with this little bit of time, I, I wonder if he'd bless it. But I used to, my flesh would make me feel bad, of course. Like, you can't read the, ba the Bible in the bathroom. What's wrong with you, Walter? <laughs> and that would be the way I'd try to reason out why I shouldn't read the Bible in the bathroom or pray in the bathroom. And then I remember that still small voice speaking to me saying, Walter... I see you in the bathroom. <laughs> you know, I see you. <laughs> a little invasive, right? But you know, he's God. Like he, he's there. He's there. Have you guys ever had a child when they go potty and they're first learning? Where are you at? 
you're right there with them in the bathroom. You got to hold their hand when they go potty because they're children. They, God is right there. And I remember just the Spirit of God speaking to me, saying, if you give me the time, I'll bless it. I'll bless it. You, be, you, just, you give me time and I'll bless it. Well, that's where I was willing to give, so I gave. And God just blessed it. But that's one of the places I prayed. When Jesus was at the Mount of Transfiguration, you know what he was doing? He was praying. When children were brought to Jesus, you know what happened? He prayed for them. At the Last Supper, you know what Jesus did? He prayed. When he was facing the cross, he prayed. In the Garden of Gethsemane, as he was about to be delivered up, you know what he was doing? He's probably in some of the heaviest prayer he's ever been in. Now this is one that, you know, for all of us who have all of our excuses, when Jesus was hanging on the cross, you know what he did? He prayed. He prayed. The life of Christ is characterized by prayer. Do you know what prayer is? What is it? Communication with God. That's all it is. We make it this odd thing where it's only holy men. Every Christian should pray always. We should be in a constant communication, a constant connection with the Lord. And there's this famous verse in the book of James. And he says, you have not. Because you ask not. You don't have things because you don't ask for them. We find that he's talking more about patience and things of that nature. But the things that we lack as Christians, we don't have them because we don't ask for them. We don't petition God for them. Did you know God wants to give you, so to speak, a bowl of ice cream? God would love to give you a bowl of ice cream, so to speak. I was talking about ice cream earlier, how my kids, when they would want ice cream, they wouldn't ask. But I knew they wanted ice cream. And all I wanted them to do was ask. I wanted to give them a bowl of ice cream. But I wanted them to ask for that bowl of ice cream. God wants to give you patience. God wants to give you strength. God wants to give you the desires of your heart. So long as they conform to His. But many of us don't have the things that God wants to give us because we don't ask. Well, God knows what I want. But that's not relationship. God's relation. He's a relational being. God wants the communication. God wants the interaction. If God didn't care about the interaction, He'd have just made you a robot. You'd be an iPhone. You just do what He tells you to do as a compute, as a computer. He puts in the numbers and it computes, and you just do what it says in automaton. God doesn't want that. He wants relationship. God wants to give you the things. That he has for you, but he wants you to ask. Part of that is God wants you to seek out the things that he has for you. You know, a lot of Christians just they sit back and they don't they do nothing. They're lazy. They're bum Christians. It's the truth. Call it what it is. You see those guys on the side of the road? A lot of Christians live like that spiritually. And they want to know what God's will is, but they don't want to do anything to ascertain the will of God. They don't want to do anything to go forward and gain the will of God to figure out what His will is. So they just pray and they sit there and hope, Oh Lord, just tell me what you want me to do. And the second somebody comes and challenges them to any degree, they're offended and they're angry. Don't judge me, brother. Oh, don't do something worthy of being judged. <laughs> you know, you're going to sit there like a bum. I'm going to call you a bum. What does it mean? Well, my goal is that, my hope is that you'd be encouraged and stop being a bum. Amen. Pick up the word of God. Do something for the faith. In chapter 17, it starts off saying, Jesus spoke these things. Now the things that are mentioned here, it's a very general term. And it's referring to everything Jesus has spoken from chapter 14 through chapter 16. That would be the work of the Holy Spirit, the sorrow turned to joy, the bearing of fruit, the pruning of that fruit. 
It would be the going away and preparing a place for you. All of these things that Jesus had previously said. Remember, th- it, since like chapter 13, from 13 to 21, it's like a 24-hour period. Something of that name, 13 to 20, chapter 20. All that takes place within a 24-hour period. So since chapter 13, it's only been a couple hours. And so all these things Jesus has been pouring out to them, all these things he's been saying, I mean, he's packing them full of all of this information. And it seems like so much to take in, but you remember what Jesus said? He says, when the Spirit of God comes, when I give you my Spirit, he'll bring to remembrance all of these things. So he says, these, these things Jesus spoke. And lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Now we know that he's on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, and it's very possible that he's already there. Well, we don't know, we're not told. But it's likely that he's already there, because Gethsemane wasn't very far from where they were at. If they're in Jerusalem, you cross the ravine, the Kidron Valley, you go into the Mount of Olives, and the Garden of Gethsemane was somewhere in that area. It wasn't a very far walk. So it's likely they're already there. He lifts up his eyes to heaven, and he prays. Now I want you to note that. He doesn't bow his head. He doesn't put his hands together. It says he lifts up his eyes. That's mentioned more than once in the Gospels, that when he prayed... He would lift up his eyes to heaven. Why is it that we bow our heads and why is it that we clasp our hands? Just it's, it's a religious practice. Something we were taught to do. It's not something that's biblical or that's commanded. It's just something that we've been taught. So we reiterate it because we've been taught it. I remember the first time I was challenged with this. I was in the school of ministry and we were off on a retreat. That's how the ministry started. And that's one of the things my theology teacher had proposed. He's like, I want you guys all to, instead of praying, go pray. But instead of bowing your heads and clasping your hands, I want you to raise your hands and look up. And then this is one of the places that he brought us to. He said, this is how Jesus prayed often. He looked up to heaven and he lifted his hands and he would pray. Rather than bowing his head. Now is bowing your head wrong? Nah, there's, there's no way that the Bible says you should pray. You, we should pray in spirit and truth. We should pray according to the truth. There are ways we should pray, but there is no stance that we should, that, that, that's the right way. The right way is having the right attitude and heart while you pray. The position isn't the big importance. So know that if you don't want to do this, you don't have to. You know what's a great way to pray? Or you're out there and you're driving, you're just cruising along, Lord, I love you. Ah, oh, you're so good to me, God. Don't close your don't close your eyes. You know, you close your eyes, you're gonna be in a lawsuit. You know, you're gonna be going to court. Or you're gonna be meeting Jesus prematurely. You know. Don't look up. Keep your eyes on the road. For sure don't bow your head. You know, don't clasp your hands. You need those to drive. It's a great it's a great place to pray. One of my favorite things about driving my motorcycle is seriously is when I get on my motorcycle, I get real religious. I start praying like crazy. I do, but I love the ride. But I mean, I'm praying, Lord, don't let somebody hit me. <laughs> you know, Albuquerque drivers are stupid. But I love the ride, and I just, I'll pray. And then, you know, I start noticing the sky and the trees and the wind in my face and cross the river. And I just, I'm just thanking God for His magnificence, for His goodness. I even look up sometimes, but I just for a moment, you know, because... I don't want to wreck because a motorcycle wreck, you're more likely to die. But, you know, so. But it's one of the things I love most about my bike. It's not so much the ride, it's man, when I hop on, I, I just feel like I talk to God more than I do on a normal drive. But driving is a great place to pray. Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven. You'll notice often when I say, let's pray, I'll say it one of two ways, typically. I'll either say, let's pray, or. Let's bow our hearts. I'll never say bow our heads. And I feel bad sometimes when people say, let's bow our heads because I typically feel rebellious because I'm like, I don't want to bow my head. I want to bow my heart though because a bowed heart is a sign of reverence to the Lord. I think a bowed heart is so much more important than a bowed head. Bow your heart before the Lord. I say, lift your hands, raise your eyes. If you want to bow your head, you're welcome to. But you don't have to. Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven. 
And he says, Father, the hour has come. Now that's a really important phrase. The hour has come because this has been a phrase that has been used throughout scriptures. My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. His hour, John speaking of Christ, had not yet come. When it speaks of this hour, it's not a reference of the 24-hour cycle. Rather, it's a reference set for a specific season, for a specific event. What's that event? Well, this hour marks the end of his earthly ministry. It marks his death, his resurrection, and his ascension. So it's not like a physical hour. It's a, it, what did I write down here? It's a season. It's, 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 it's a specific set of events that's taking place. Um, we use language like this in English. We say things like, I'll be a minute. Now, if we're going to be literal, how, how long is a minute? Now, what can you get done in 60 seconds? Not a whole lot. You don't get a whole lot done in 60 seconds. You can get some stuff done. You can blow your nose in 60 seconds. <laughs> Depending on how bad the boogers are stuck up there, you know. Sometimes you're there, you know, having a, a wrestling match with your nostrils. But, I mean... By and far, you can blow your nose in 60 seconds. You know, you can put your shoes on in 60 seconds most of the time. You know, if you're a man, you can get dressed in 60 seconds. Women, that excludes you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Some women. But there's not a lot you can get done. So when we say, I'm going to be a minute, most of us as Americans know that a minute isn't a literal 60 seconds. It's just a time frame. All right, you'll be here soon. And so when he says the hour has come, he's not talking about a specific 60-minute period. He's talking about a set of events that has been pre-prepared for this time. And he says, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Now, how would this glory come about? He says, glorify your son that the son may glorify you. You. The way that the Son glorifies the Father and that the Father glorifies the Son is the accomplishing of the divine plan of salvation. That is how the Father is glorified and how the Son is glorified. In the divine accomplish in the accomplishing of the divine plan of salvation that was set forth, do you know from how long ago? In Revelation chapter thirteen, verse eight, we're given a little piece of information here that tells us how long God has been preparing this plan. In 13.8 of Revelation, it says, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, Jesus, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That means before God even laid the foundation of the world, he had it set in his plans to die for the sin of the world, to resurrect and ascend back up into heaven. It was always his plan. This is how the Son would be glorified, and in the Son being glorified, the Father is glorified. It was always His plan. Do you know why the Lord had to die? Does anybody have any idea of why Jesus had to come and why Jesus had to die? Well, for sins, why couldn't God just create life without sin? But what, why couldn't His plan just be no sin? Wouldn't that have been simpler? Because of free will. There's a more specific attachment to that because of love. Without free will, there can be no love. Volition is a necessary requirement for love to exist. For there to be love, there has to be the ability to not love, the ability to discard, and to do away with. If it's not an act of free will and it's forced, then it's not love. We have another word for that called rape when force is exhibited on a person that's rape God will never force himself on you God wants you to come of your own volition he wants you to surrender the same way my wife I don't want my wife to love me because she has to love me I want her to love me because she really loves me as a matter of fact before my wife and I got married I remember I was really nervous I come with my own set of insecurities. And I remember asking her, you know, do you really love me? Or do you love the idea of me? You know, if you love the idea of me, you're going to be, this is going to end up bad. 
Because if you seriously though, a lot of people think they are in love and they're not. They just love the idea of something. I, as a matter of fact, I believe most marriages are built on that. An idea rather than a reality. And that's why so many marriages end in divorce because when the reality comes to fruition and you realize, who is this person? Well, you set the wrong standards on them from the beginning. You, you put unrealistic ideas and expectations on them. You didn't marry them. You married an idea of them. And now that that idea is gone and the reality sets in, you're like, what is this? I didn't marry this. No, you did. That's exactly what you married. That's just not what you wanted to see. I remember asking my wife, do you love me or do you love the idea of me? She said, Walter, I love you. You're a pain in my butt, she said, but I love you. I said, then you, you love me. You know, you love me. She may not have used those exact words, but you know, I needed to know because I, I needed to know that if I'm going into this, I needed to know that you truly love me or it's not going to work. It has, there has to be the volition, the free will of knowing and choosing to submit and be obedient for there to be love. This was always God's plan because He doesn't want robots. Kind of goes back to the opening statement, right? God wants us to ask. He's a relational being. Relation. The Lord loves you. He always has. And He always had this plan to save you. For some of us, that means a lot. If that doesn't mean a lot to you, you know, maybe go home and pray about it and ask God, why doesn't it mean as much to me as it should? That should mean the world to you, that you were always on the Lord's heart and mind from the moment He created all things. You were on His heart, you were on His mind, and He set salvation for you in play. That's a biggie right there. There are a couple key elements that I want us to notice here in this first verse. It says, He lifted up His eyes to heaven and He said, Father, now, who is he praying to? His father. Father, glorify your son, that the son may glorify you. He's praying to the father. He's even asking for the father to glorify him. The question that may come to mind is, does this mean he's not God? Absolutely not. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 through 9, and I'm actually going to turn there because I want to read this. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 through 9. Now, typically I'd focus on just 7 and 9, but 1 through 6 are so good. I'm just going to read them so you can hear them. It says, Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. Now verse 7 through 9, this is what I really want us to see. But emptied himself taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 7, it says, You have made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor and have appointed him over the works of your hands. The point that I want you to hear is Christ emptied himself out. He never stopped being God. However, he did put down his weight in glory. He left the throne room of heaven in order to become fully human, to be able to live out this experience. He came as a human so that he could reach humanity, the greatest expression of love, by dying on the cross. He left the throne room of heaven to accomplish salvation, submitting himself to the will of the Father. Hence, he's asking the Father of these things. He's every bit equal with God in his Godship, but in his humanity, he was lower than the Lord positionally, not qualitatively. Quality-wise, he's God. Positionally, he put himself here. Hebrews actually says, even for a little while, he was lower than the angels. 
because the angels are still in heaven. Jesus humbled himself to be on earth, as Paul just said, even to the form of a bond slave. That's one of the lowest forms of humanity of that time, to be a bond slave. It's about as low as you go. Now, he made himself low, but the goal here was to re-glorify the Son. Now, notice the word I use, re-glorify. Jesus isn't going to be glorified for the first time. He's going to reassume his position that is rightfully his in heaven. Hence, he says back in John, Father, glorify the Son that the Son may glorify you. Bring me back, Lord, to that place that which is mine. Well, how do I know that he was there before? Because when we get to verse 5, he's going to say, Glorify me again with the glory that I had with you before the world was. He was always there. But for a small moment in time, he made himself lower than his glory so that he could save us and be re-glorified to his original position. In verse 2, it says, Even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him he may give eternal life. Now, there's some really important things here in verse 2. He says, even as you gave him authority over all flesh. The word authority here is the Greek word exosia. And it means power of choice. Power of choice. You have given authority. You've given the power of choice over all flesh. And he says, all that you have given me, that I may give them eternal life. Now, there is a doctrine out there known as selective predestination. A more simpler term is Calvinism. Calvinism is the idea or the theological doctrine that God chooses people for salvation. But also, God chooses people for hell. And the question in Calvinism is, which one are you? Are you chosen by God for heaven or are you chosen by God for hell? And if you were chosen by God for heaven, you have no choice in the matter. And you can't say no, you can't reject it. You have to come because, well, God makes you come. Kind of does away with the whole relational being part, but that's what they believe. And if you're going to hell, you had no choice in the matter. You have to go to hell because God made you for that purpose. Does that sit wrong with anybody in here? I say it's really wrong with me. That's, if that's God, I, I really don't want any part in that. But, but brother, you're saved for heaven. I don't want to go to heaven if that's, if that's the God we're going to serve. If God made some people just to go to hell, then I don't want any part of that. I, 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 that's not righteous. That's not the righteousness that the Bible describes of God. Sorry, my mustache is messing with me. But he says, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. But it says right here, right? All whom you have given him, the Son, to them he can give eternal life. So doesn't that support the Calvinistic doctrine? No. Not even close. Well, how do you figure it? just said that. Well, it only says that if you skip the first part of that verse again. Because when we look at the beginning of verse 2, it says, Even as you gave him authority over all flesh... You gave him power of choice over all flesh. You gave him, we'd call it power of attorney over all flesh. It's yours, Jesus. God has given you all flesh. How much is all flesh? How much would you guys guess that is? All flesh. So God gave him all, right? And then it says, To all whom you have given him, he may give eternal life. Well, how many has God given him? All. All. So to all he can give eternal life because all flesh was given to him. So how many people does eternal life extend to? The invitation extends to all. How many come into eternal life? Those who accept it. Those who accept it. All flesh has been given to the Lord and for that all flesh that has been given to him, he has given the right to give eternal life to. That's everybody. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that whoever believes in him. How many is whoever? It's as many as all. As many as, many as would come. As many as would believe. All who believe in him would have eternal life. They would not perish. Eternal life extends to the world. 
And it boggles my mind that there are Christians, there are believers out there who actually think that God has created some for destruction. We're going to see here why that's a big problem with me going forward, especially concerning the will of God. I'll just tell you, in the Bible it says, it's the will of God that none should perish. All right? If it's the will of God that none should perish, then how can that same God will it that some be designed for destruction and perish? That's either a schizophrenic God or, you know, we've we got some serious problems here. That's not consistent with truth. So either he's designed some for destruction or he desires that none should be destroyed. Which is it? Or we're seeing the text wrong. And I believe many of these Calvinists see the text wrong. Now, as many believe come to salvation, what does it mean to believe? The word that most particularly comes to mind is to trust Him. To trust. To believe is to trust Him. What does trust do? Well, what is trust, I should say? It's an action, right? Trust brings about an action of a person. When you trust something, if you trust that pressing the gas of your car is going to move you forward, what are you going to do? You're going to press your gas to go forward because you want to go forward. You trust the design, you trust the build, so you press the gas, you go forward. If you trust that you're going to be protected by the police, who are you going to call? You're going to call the police. Don't call APD, though. You're going to take like 10 days to get there. You know, you'd be in a shootout. We'll be there in four hours. You know, just stay home. I'll handle it, bro. You know, like, <laughs> que muchacho, you know. But if you trust that you're going to be protected by the police, you're going to call the police. If you trust in the Lord, if you put your weight of all you believe on Him and you trust what He said, you trust that He's going to accomplish what He's accomplished, you trust that He is yours and yours, you trust He's going to give you His Spirit, you trust that when you die, you're going to go to be in His presence, you trust that in the resurrection, you will rise to be with Him, you will be saved. That is the confidence that a believer has. If you don't trust Him, well, you do none of those things. Here's the thing, when you trust Him, it changes the way you think changes the way you act, the way you talk, the way you live. That's the difference between a person who believes and a person who doesn't believe. Someone who doesn't believe, they just stay the same old them they've always been because they actually don't trust and believe what the Lord has said. Those who trust or who believe, it changes the way we view life, the way we think because we believe what He said. And not just that, when you believe what He said, when you trust Him, he gives you His Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit helps us to understand, helps us to believe further, helps us to move forward in power and in strength. There's only a couple people in this world who cannot receive salvation. There's a couple things that people can do to not receive salvation. One, those who don't want it. If you don't want salvation, then you don't get salvation. Two, those who die rejecting it. That's it. Those are the only two types of people that cannot be saved. The first one has hope. They don't want Jesus, but they can accept him before they die. The one who dies rejecting Jesus, there is no hope for that person. They, there is no hope. In the next life, all who have rejected Christ will have a change of heart. It'll be too late. All of them will have a change of heart. They will stand before the living God and, oops. They will bow. They will confess he is the Lord because the Bible says, all will bow and confess the name of Jesus as Lord. But if you die rejecting Christ, there is no hope at that point. There is no hope. It'll be too late. So how can we avoid that? Well, believe in Him now. Trust in Him now. I, I call it stupid, simple belief. The Lord has made it so easy that it's stupid, simple. You could be a very unintellectual person and get it. Well, what do I got to do? Believe. Trust Him. How do I do that? Well, I'll keep coming to church and read the Bible and do what it says. Do what He's asked of you. Believe what He's said of, of you and for you and what He's said of who He is. Believe Him. Trust Him. It's very simple. It's not complicated. What is eternal life? In verse 3, He says, This is eternal life, that you may know the one and only, or the only true God, and Jesus Christ 
whom you have sent. What is eternal life? To know God. The Bible says God is life. Did you know there's only one eternal being? That's God. He's the only one that's eternal. Nothing else is eternal. For the longest time, scientists thought the universe was eternal. Turns out it's not. The law of thermodynamics tells us it's not. It's dying down. We're losing energy. We're expanding like some of our faces. Yeah. <laughs> you see it in the wrinkles. I wonder if that's how the universe looks. starting to look all wrinkly and sun-dried. <laughs> you know? But the universe is dying down. It used to be all tight and close together and looked all fresh. Now it's all old and wrinkly. <laughs> it's not eternal. It has a time limit. Our sun has a time limit. All of us have time limits. Some of our faces look like the universe. You go in the mirror, you look, it's all wrinkly and psh, start getting those sunspots or whatever they're called. You know, you get old. We all, we're all headed that way. I keep noticing things on my face that weren't there a few years back. And I'm, what the heck is this? And what's this? And there's a little mark here. And holy smokes, I'm getting old. The white hairs are coming in. <laughs> if I if I start balding, I'm just gonna shave it. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna play that game. You know, but you know, there's only one eternal being. It's one of the reasons that frustrates me, and I say it sometimes too. You know, they've gone off to 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 what's the word we use um when we say people have gone to the Lord to eternity. Nobody goes to eternity. Only God. The angels don't experience eternity. They were created beings. We are all immortal beings. You know what immortal means? It means we have a start with no end. You will live forever. But you do have a start, which means you didn't exist at some point. To be eternal means you're non-created. There is no beginning and there is no end. What does that mean? I don't know. Because finite beings can't explain away the infinite. Because we're finite. We have capacities. Eternal means no capacity. Don't know how that works out. I don't think we'll ever understand how that works, even when we get to heaven. It's too big for us. Only God is eternal. God is life. God is eternal. To know Him is to have eternal life. How, how long is eternal? Forever. That's the idea. Forever life. To know God is to have eternal life. The Greek word here for know is genoskosin. Genoskosin. That's a particular verb of know. And it, it, it's in the present tense and it means to have a continuous action or a continuous state of persistence of knowing God. You never stop knowing God. You continue to always know God. You have that kind of trust in Him, that kind of belief. You have eternal life. The thing is, once you know God, you can't unknow God. You know, there are people who fall away from the faith. And I believe it's genuinely because they were playing religion. I believe they experienced God. I believe they saw the power of God. I believe they even experienced the power of God. Because that's what happens, right? When you show up in a church service, there are genuine believers here. And as God pours the blessing out on the body, sometimes those who are non-believers or even playing religion experience part of the benefit of that outpouring. Hebrews talks about that. When they've experienced and tasted God and then they've fallen away, how could they ever be restored? They weren't ever born again. They experienced the outpouring because God poured it out on His children and they were present. It's like when my, friend, my, 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 my friends would invite me over for dinner when I was a kid, I would experience the blessing of what their parents would pour out because I was with them at the time. But I wasn't a child of theirs. But because I was present, I experienced the dinner. I experienced the dessert and whatever outpouring came from that. No God. Don't just know about God. Know Him. Have a personal relationship with Him. This word that Jesus says here, eternal life, it's the Greek construct, Ionios Zoe. Now, it's not just a quantity of life. When we think of eternal, you know, it's forever. It is forever. Ionios Zoe is the quality of eternal life. 
It's a quality of life. Zoe literally means to have life the way God intended life to be lived. Eternal life. It's something we experience in this life and it continues off into the life to come. Quality of life. A lot of people are alive. They're just not living. That's what Zoe is. It's the life that God intended. And so when the Lord talks about having eternal life, He doesn't want you to just exist. He wants you to experience the purpose and the reason He created you for. Now what is that purpose and reason? I mean, we can, there's specifics and there's non-specific. The non-specific is there are certain wills for God in your life. One of the wills of God is that you believe. I'm going to mention some more here in a moment, so I don't want to get ahead of myself. But there are too many people out there just existing and they're not living. If you're just existing and you're not living, yeah, it's simple. Repent of your sin and believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Entrust yourself to Him. What does it mean to entrust? Obey Him. You trust Him, obey Him. If He says, if you obey me, you love me. You love me if you do what I say. Obey Him. That's the greatest form of trusting Him. Do what He said. But it doesn't make sense, Lord. He's not asking you to rationalize what He's asked you. He's asking you to trust what He said. You trust Him? Do we trust Jesus? Then live like it. If you ain't living like you trust Him, then you probably don't trust Him. In verse 4, he says, I have glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. He says, I've glorified you by accomplishing the work. Now, this was no easy task. Jesus took on the full weight of humanity. He put down his weight and glory and he put on flesh. Now, for most of us, that doesn't seem like a big deal. Let me ask you guys this. Has anybody ever had the thought, God doesn't understand? Has anybody ever thought that? I have. Most humans have. I believe this is one of the reasons it was so necessary for him to come in human form. God just doesn't understand what I'm going through. Oh, doesn't he? In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it tells us, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. What struggles have accompanied you in your life? Yet Jesus experienced them too. He knows what it's like to be hungry, to be homeless. I'd imagine lust. He says he, he's experienced all temptations as we have, yet without sin. Remember, temptation isn't sin. Whatever it is you've experienced, he's experienced, and yet maintained his faithfulness to the Lord. Jesus doesn't understand me. He knows you better than you know yourself. And he doesn't just know you because he's God. He's experienced what you experience. And yet he's overcome. It's, it's important. I want to I look at something here. He says, I have glorified you on earth having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. How is it that he glorified God? He glorified God by doing what God sent him to do. By doing what the Father sent him to do. He glorified God in his obedience. That's the primary way he glorified his father by obeying him question how do you guys glorify God how do we glorify God how do I glorify God how is it that I am obedient to the Lord many of you say well well, it's easy for you God called you to be a pastor so you're up there teaching I don't know what God has told me to do well here I'll share with you some of the wills of God 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, the Bible, Paul writing says, it's the will of God that we maintain sexual purity. It's the will of God that we abstain from sexual immorality, that we maintain sexual purity. What does that mean? If you're not married, you shouldn't be having sex. If you're having sex, it should only be with your married spouse, and you should not be married to someone of the same sex. Amen. That's what that means. Anything outside of that is sexual immorality. Well, I'm straight and we just have sex. You're in sin. Well, I'm married. I'm having sex with my spouse. You're in sin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you'd be crazy some of the things people rationalize. 
I watch pornography. You're in sin. That's sexual immorality. Jesus called that adultery. Why just look? You're in sin. By looking, Jesus said, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you know, you know what he says that's equated to before God? It's adultery. Well, it's not fair. Eh, well, do you trust Jesus or not? And then trust what he said. Because those words came directly out of his mouth. It's the will of God that we maintain sexual purity. That's one way we can all glorify God, by being sexually abstinent if you're not married. And when you get married, only to your spouse. Well, I'm tired of my spouse. Then rekindle that fire. If you're tired of your spouse, that's a you problem. That's a you guys problem. You guys have let the relationship go. That's, that's how that works. You become focused on other things. You're more, you're more focused on, on how my burger's cooked. What's on TV. What's the next vacation going to work? You have let the fire die from your marriage if that's the case. The only reason marriages truly fail is because we stop pouring into them. We stop cultivating the ground. We stop sowing the seed and we stop watering the seeds and the plants. We let the rats and we let the pests in and we stop tending our garden and that's why marriages fail. Sexual purity. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. It's the will of God that you give thanks in all circumstances. What? All circumstances? That's what the Bible says. So how can you glorify God? Be thankful in all circumstances. But I don't like the circumstance I'm in. Could be worse. Could always be worse. But I'm going to die tonight. You could be going to hell. Could be worse. Oh, I'm going to hell. Then you don't know the Lord, so this doesn't apply to you. So it does, you know, you know, give thanks in all circumstances. That's a hard one to do. It's hard to give thanks to God when we're hurting. And I believe the reason is because we're selfish. Rather than seeing God in the midst of the hurt and, let, and seeing what He's doing, we're focused on ourselves and our own hurt and pain, and we bypass the blessing that I believe God wants to give us. I can't see how God would bless me in this hard time. It's because you're selfish and you're looking at yourself instead of looking at God. One of the best times in my, in my life. Some of the best times in my life have been the most dark hours because that's when God showed up the greatest. And, I'm, and I mean, it was hard to be thankful in those circumstances, but I was. I was hurt, I was angry, and then I was thankful. Because I, I, you know, when I look at me, it's where the hurt and the anger and all the frustration came in. And when I get away from myself and look up, I was thankful because, man, it could have been so much worse. God was so good, even in the midst of that, those dark hours. And you know what the crazy part is? A lot of those dark hours were brought on by myself. Not all of them. Some of them were circumstances that I truly had no control over. That's one of the ways that we can be glorifying to God is being thankful in all circumstances. In Ephesians 5.17, and this will be the last will of God that I give you. These are all, to write these down, go look. It says, this is the will of God for your life. One of the wills of God for your life, be careful how you walk to not walk in sin. It's the will of God that you not walk in the flesh. What is the flesh? Sexual immorality, carousing, drunkenness, anger, disputes, jealousies. He lists off a mention of them. Read like Ephesians 5, like 13 through like 20, something like that. It explains it all right there. But right there in verse 17, it says, this is the will of God for your life. So you might not have a specific will, as in like, well, God has told me that I'm going to scrub the toilets. That's my ministry to God, which that is, that's a real ministry. You know, when people come and they do things at the church, that's ministry. That's ministry. That bears part of the burden of the church. Not all ministry is up here from the pulpit and it's not here doing worship. That's just, just, those are just pieces of ministry. The body works as a whole. Yeah, God will call all of us to specific ministries within His body. But then there's, this, there's the general ministry of the will of God to glorify Him and by doing these things. Stay away from sexual immorality. Give thanks to God in all circumstances. Be careful how you walk so as not to walk in the flesh. 
when we walk in the flesh, we dishonor God. And one of the primary ways is we give the world a reason and an occasion to blaspheme God because of our inadequate actions. In verse 5, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. He's saying, Father, glorify me to the original position that I had with you from before creation. Now, glorify is used five times in these five verses. Five times. There's a reason it's used five times. It wants us to take note of this word, glory. It's the Greek word, doxadzo. And it means to be magnified with splendor, to be extolled and to be praised. I, I would never hope you guys would do that to me. Don't, don't glorify me. I'm, I'm a dirty little sinner. We glorify the sinless one. We glorify God. Now, in my opinion, this is one of the strongest verses in the Bible for the divinity of Christ. When people talk about how, you know, Jesus isn't God. He never calls him God. Father, glorify me with you. With the glory which I had with you before the world. Glorify me read that so father glorify me together with yourself with the glory which i had with you before the world was in isaiah chapter 42 verse 8 god speaks and says i am yahweh that is my name i will not give my glory to another nor my praise to graven images who will god share his glory with no one yet jesus here says father glorify me again with you, so that I descend to the glory which I had with you before the world was. So what does that mean? It either means that Jesus is out of his mind or we have a wrong idea of God. Or he's exactly who he said he is. C.S. Lewis says he's the Lord, he's a liar, or he's a lunatic. Now, for us to make sense of this, because this is really important, we, we want to understand who God is, right? We have to stop thinking of God as a person. And rather than a person, think of God as a title, because God is a title, not a person. Think of the Godship as an entity, right? And within that entity exist the persons of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And these three persons make the Godship what it is. When we think of God, we typically just think the Father, which it is, often at the exclusion of the Son and the Spirit. When we think of God, this, it's a triune nature. The Father is not the Son, the Son's not the Spirit, the Spirit is not the Father, yet the three of them co-reign as God. They're all the God. How can they be the God? Shouldn't it be the gods? No, no, it's singular a compound unity. It's the same way that my wife and I are one. Compound unity. We are one in unity. One in essence, but two distinct persons. Can we have a marriage if one of us is excluded? You can't. By the definition of what marriage is, there has to be two of us for the one, for the unity of marriage to exist. And for the unity of God to exist. As a matter of fact, that's even how God is spelled out in the Bible. In the beginning, when it says, God created the heavens and the earth, that word God is Elohim, which is a plural for God. It's the compound unity of who He is. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So, if God exists as three separate and distinct persons, but as one entity, as the unity of the Godship, that means the Father can be glorified, the Son can be glorified, and the Holy Spirit can be glorified, all maintaining the identity, identity of the God. Hence Jesus says, Father, glorify me again with you, with the glory that I had with you before the world was. He is God. He has never stopped claiming to be God. He has always claimed to be God. The Bible says it throughout if Jesus isn't God, his sacrifice is in vain. He's a sinner. It's not accepted. Our sins are intact and we are all headed to hell and we've all believed in a lie. If he's God and we can throw our trust on him fully, then we have 
absolute confidence that when we die, we will go to be with Him and in His presence for all time. God doesn't share His glory. And He's not going to share His glory with anyone except for the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. They are glorified together. And they three make God what He is. Again, now Father, glorify me together with Yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. I'd encourage you, if anybody ever challenges the deity of Christ, bring them here. There's, there's very little that that could mean. It simply means, Father, give me the position that I always had with you before the world. You know who created the heavens and the earth and all that exists in them? The Bible tells us. You can find it in separate spots. There's one spot that says the Father created all things. The Bible also says that the Spirit created all things, the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says Jesus created all things. Who is the creator of heaven and earth? God. Who is God? The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. You know, the Bible says that the Father raised Jesus from the dead. The Bible also says the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. The Bible also says Jesus raised himself from the dead. Those are separate and distinct verses. Again, Jesus is the Lord God. Well, I'm going to stop there because we're out of time, and that's why I don't want to go past verse 5. Some theological depths and truth that we ought to glean from this. God is a personal being, and He desires a personal relationship with you and I. God is not interested in having you be a robot. Don't play robot Christianity. Be who you are in Christ. Come with your quirkiness, come with your, your funky smells and your, your odd talking and don't try to be the Christian you think you should be. Be the Christian God has made you to be. What is that? I don't know. Who are you? Just be obedient to Him. Be that. Don't play Christianity. If you got rough edges, have rough edges. You talk a little funky or inappropriate, talk funky and inappropriate. That's why I don't dress in suits and stuff. Could I? Yeah. But I don't need to. Why? Because that's not who I am. I'd rather dress like this. Sometimes I have long hair, sometimes I have short hair, sometimes I have no hair, sometimes I have a shaved beard, sometimes I look like Ragnar Lothbrok. You know? Why? Because God made me this quirky little dude, and that's who I am. And I don't want to play Christianity, I want to be the body of Christ. I just want to be obedient to the Lord. I don't want to give you some fake persona of what I think a Christian should be. I want to live out my Christianity by obeying the Lord. Be that. Know that He is the living God and that you can trust what He said because He is the truth. He is eternal life and you could have that eternal life by knowing Him, by trusting Him. Father, we thank You for being God and for Your goodness, mercy, and grace. We pray, Lord, that You would go before us through the rest of this week and the coming week, the weekend into the coming week. And guide our steps, guide our thoughts, guide our words and our actions. Help us to trust you with all that we are, Lord. Help us to be obedient to you, to glorify you with our actions, Lord, to glorify you in being sexually pure, to glorify you, Lord, in giving thanks in all circumstances, and to glorify you by walking in the Spirit and not in the flesh. We pray that the world would know and see you in us, Father. We just love you so much and thank you for coming down into this world experiencing this life of humanity for us, Lord, so that you would know us on the most intimate and personal levels. Should we thank you for being our God in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Quickly, tonight, 6 p.m., we're going to be in Second Samuel chapter 16. You guys are welcome to join us. Love you guys.